Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his wonderful benefits. Now, I know some of y'all are waiting on God to do something big in your life before you decide to thank him. But children of God learn how to thank God for the little things that he's done. The Bible says, blessed be the God who loves us daily with benefits. What kind of benefits? Food on your table. Benefits, clothes on your back. Benefits, you in your right mind. Benefits, you know where your children are. And if the Lord has blessed you like that, you ain't got the right to remain silent. Brother Coffee ain't got his handcuffs on him today. He's not going to freeze anybody. So you're, you're free to praise God in the way that you will. Amen. Amen. God is good how often? And all the time, look at somebody close to you and say, neighbor, God loves you, and I do too. And if you love me as much as I love you, then nothing can break our love in two. Well, by the way, y'all been shouting glory and amen up in here this morning. I, I, I about believe you love the Lord. I, I about believe you came to give God some form of praise. Because if you like me, after the devil done beat on your head on Monday and, and Tuesday, he came and knocked on your door on Wednesday, and then he, he came to hit you upside your head on Thursday and, and Friday and Saturday, you just couldn't help but to come into God's house on Sunday morning and give God the praise that is due to him. Because my Bible tells me somewhere, if you don't want to praise him, I know two or three rocks somewhere that'll cry glory, be to God for the glory, for the wonderful thing that he has done. And let me tell you, God ain't just started being good to us. God been being good to us. God been making a way for us for a mighty long time right about now. I like how John said that John, when John wrote his gospel, he didn't start out like everybody else did talking about the childhood of Jesus. All John said was in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. God, Jesus been making a way since the beginning of time for us. How do I know that? In Genesis, he told them I was the word of God creating the heavens and the earth. In Exodus, I was the Passover lamb whose blood was sprinkled on the door of your heart so you could escape the bondage of slavery. In Leviticus, I was the temple, the place, the holy place that you go to meet God. In Numbers, I was your ever-present God, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And in Deuteronomy, I was that coming prophet that would be greater than Moses. In Joshua, I was the conquering warrior that will lead you safely to the promised land. In Judges, I was the unlikely savior who rise from weakness in order to rescue you. In Ruth, I was your redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, I was your shepherd king who rushed out to face the giants all by himself. In First and Second Kings, I was your righteous ruler. In First and Second Chronicles, I was the restorer of the kingdom. In Ezra, I was the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, I was the rebuilder of the walls. In Esther, I was your advocate in the throne room, risking my life to save yours. In Job, I was your living redeemer. In the Psalms, I was the one that heals your cries. In Proverbs, I was wisdom personified. In Ecclesiastes, I was the meaning and the madness. In the Song of Solomon, I was your lover and your bridegroom. In Isaiah, I was the son that will be born, who will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, Prince Elder everlasting father the one that will be wounded for your transgressions and bruised for your iniquities and that chastisement of your peace will be upon me and by my stripes you are healed in jeremiah i was the spirit that writes god laws on your hearts in lamentations i was the weeping prophet in ezekiel i was the river that life bringing healing to the nations in daniel i was the fourth man in the fire in hosea i was the ever faithful husband who was pursuing his ever unfaithful bride. In Joel, I was the restored that everything that the locusts had eaten up. In Amos, I was your burden bearer. In Obadiah, I was the judge of all the earth. In Jonah, I was that prophet cast out in the storm so you could be brought in. In Micah, I was the everlasting ruler that will be born to you in Bethlehem. In Habakkuk, I was your reason to rejoice even when your fields were empty. And in Zephaniah, I was the great reformer. In Haggai, I was the cleansing fountain. In Zechariah, I was the pure son whom every eye on earth would one day behold. And in Malachi, I was the son of righteousness 
rising with healing in his wings. He been being good to us. I'm about ready to preach now. Thank God for Jesus. I said, thank God for Jesus, the one who opened doors for us, the one who fights our battles for us. Do you realize that your battle does not belong to you, but the battle belongs to the Lord, the one who fixes your family situations for you? Somebody in this church this morning ought to thank God for Jesus. And I need to ask somebody, won't he make a way for you? Won't he provide for you? Won't he save you? Won't he keep you? Won't he heal you? Turn your life around. Take your feet and place them on a rock to say he's a good God. He's a mighty, mighty good God. Oh, Lord. Y'all done got me stirred up. God is good. He's always good. I'm so glad to be back here with you all here at 7009 Wilson Boulevard, Jacksonville, Florida. Here at the Sweetwater Church of Christ. So glad to be. I know um, I had a couple death threats when y'all didn't see me last month. So I, <laughs> so I had to come and redeem myself, you know, because I was feared for my life there for a minute, Brother Reed. So I had to, I had to get things in order. Amen. Just so glad to be here um, with you all. Um, always glad to be able to be here. Anybody come to hear a word from the Lord? Uh, you came to the right place. Psalm chapter 27. Psalm chapter 27, verses 1 through 5, and then we're going to look at Psalms chapter 122 and verse number 1. The grass withers, and the flower thereof fadeth away, but the word of God shall stand forever. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Psalm chapter 27, first of all, verses 1 through 5. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. In whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat my flesh, they stumble and they fail. Good God Almighty. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise up against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of my trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Psalm chapter 122 and verse number 1. I was glad when they said unto me, come and let us go into the house of the Lord. Look at somebody near you that look like they don't want you to speak to them and say, neighbor, you ought to be glad to be in God's house. Look at somebody else and say, neighbor, I don't know about you, but I'm sure enough glad to be in God's house. Amen. The church, with all of her auxiliaries and ministries, is a unique organism that has no peers. My brothers and sisters, there's nothing quite like the church in all of the world. Even with all of these man-made doctrines and all this stuff that we got going on, you cannot change the true essence of the Lord's church. The church is many things to many people. For some, the church is a lighthouse, shining its light into the darkness of this world. To others, the church is a hospital ministering to the hurting. While for others, the church is a lifeboat rescuing victims from the raging seas of life. And yes, my brothers and sisters, we praise God for this opportunity to collectively gather together and praise his name for there is no place like the church. David, this poetic ballad, writes in a masterful way that reveals his joy 
and his love for the Lord. David has been through some tough times in his life. He, he had felt the weight of the world on his shoulders, but after he reflects over his life, he recognized that there's no place like the public meeting place of our God. And my brothers and sisters, whenever life seems to get the best of us, it is critically vital that we press our way to the house of God. Now, I know we got it backwards when stuff going on. We like to stay away from the house of God. But when stuff is going on in your life, you ought to even more press your way to the house of God. I know many who face trials and tribulations and instead of coming to the Lord's house, they suck and they have pity parties. But my brothers and my I don't know about you, but but when you really meditate on how good God has been to us, I don't care what I go through. I just can't help but to come to God's house. David says, I was glad when they said unto me, come, let us go into the house of the Lord, which signifies some form of corporate worship here. Too many people are saying that I don't have to go to church to worship God. But let me tell you something. God has designed a public place for his people to worship together. I know you can you say I can read my Bible at home. That's good. I can read my Bible at home too. But I still need to come into God's house and give him the praise. The church is God's chosen place for his children to worship him. It's good to worship God in private. But you must also worship God in the public. David was excited about going to church. And my brothers and sisters, we ought to demonstrate enthusiasm when it's time to come and worship the Lord. We should never feel like coming to the Lord's house is a burden for us. You, you, you've heard um, me say maybe, or, or I know my folk have heard me say it all the time, that we should not just come into the church any kind of way, but we should come into the Lord's house with praise in our hearts that manifests itself in our lives and on the fruit of our lips. Somebody ought to know that you're glad about Jesus. Our primary purpose for coming together as a collective body is to praise, honor, and glorify God. Now, I know sometimes people, they come with their own uh, motives and their own ideals about things, but the main reason we are here is not for none of that. The reason that we are here is to glorify God. Not so the preacher can get no glory, not so no brother, no sister can get no glory, so that God could get all the glory and the praise that is due to him. Not to throw stones, and while thrown stone throwing may go on, there's still no place for that in God's house. I don't care where you go, let me tell you something. You're not going to find a church that is without spot, without some kind of problem going on on this side of heaven. Isn't it strange how some folk just go from church to church for whatever reason, but will stay in an abusive relationship or even on a hellish job for years? and never see a problem with that, contrary to popular opinion, the church is not a convalescent home where people just sit around and wait to die. The church is not a circus where each member puts on their own little act. Like the church is not an ice house where people with cold hearts give others the cold shoulder. It's the house of God. When the saints of God assemble themselves for the purpose that God intended for us, he makes his presence known. In genuine worship, the Father is glorified, the Son is magnified, and the Holy Spirit is gratified. The Bible is ratified, and the saints are edified, and man's soul is satisfied. Amen. So, so the word worship comes from the word worship, meaning that God is worthy. He deserves our praise. Worship is our response to all God is and says and does. When we really believe God deserves our worship, nothing will keep us away from church. Church worship is a matter of priorities. Worship has been described as the, the most urgent, the most glorious action that can take place in the human life. We ought to worship God in our home. But that is not enough. We must go into the house of the Lord. In worship, we learn to respond to the ups and downs in life. We discover that 
Faith means trusting God even when life don't make too much of sense. We understand that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, but some folk think that church is a place to be entertained. If it's enjoyable, they'll come. But at the end of the show, they'll applause that met the only applause that matters is the applause that comes from God. Now you see, when I come into the house of God, my praise is not to satisfy you. My praise is not so that you will be interested in it, but I'm trying to put on a show for God. Well, you clap too loud, build a bridge and get over it. You don't know what God did in my life. You don't know how God wiped my weary eyes. You don't know how God moved that stone out of my heart. How God gave me a peace that surpasses all understanding. And you think I'm going to let you stop me from giving God the glory that's due to him? You a special kind of crazy. Do you think that? Why is David glad when he's told, let's go to the house of the Lord? Number one, he knows that he's going to find his spiritual family there. He knows that he will learn about how life really works. He knows that he'll gain strength for the days that are coming ahead of him. Nothing's going to keep him from worship. How can we know a person's priorities? By what that person does willingly and voluntarily. Worship is not described here as an individual act. We do not live in isolation. We are part of something larger than what we are. Faith isn't purely internal. It has to be lived out in our action. My body ought to be available to the body of Christ. There are two things that you can't do by yourself. One is be married by yourself. Some people marry by themselves, but you, you can't be married by yourself. And the other thing is you can't be a Christian by yourself. There are many ways to worship God when we gather in his house. Some people clap their hands. Some people pat their feet because some people just got different, experience, different expressions of worship when they think about how good God has been to them. But here it is. Let me put you on notice. Let me tell you, just because somebody else is praising God, don't give you room to try and regulate how they praise God. You know, you got some folk in the church, they bring their thermometer to church with them. And here it is when they feel like you're getting just a little too out of the way with your praise. They want to come up and try and turn the thermometer down on your praise. But here it is. It's just like this. Any of y'all football fans, you know, in the football, there, there's one thing, there's one rule out of all the, the penalties that can hurt a football team. The one that intrigues me the most, brother, is the one they call excessive celebration. Excessive celebration means that you can be fined or penalized for celebrating too much after a touchdown or after an interception. But the thing about that is, it's subjective. Meaning that one referee can look at it and say, oh, that's nothing. And then another referee can look at it and say, oh, oh, that's too much. You playing that. I mean, how would you know to move left when he moved left there? How would you know to move right when he moved right? Y'all playing that. That's too much. And that's excessive. Well, preacher, what are you talking about? Because there are too many people in the church today that are acting like NFL referees. And every time somebody wants to give God glory, they always throwing flags and saying, oh, you're doing too much. It don't take all of that. you getting out of the way. you causing me to stumble. Stumble all you want to. Don't nobody know like I know what God did for me. Praise and worship is a personal thing. What I got going on with God is between me and God. It ain't got nothing to do with you. Maybe if you worry more about your praise and your relationship with God instead of worry about what I got going on. Amen, carpet. There are many ways, church, to worship God when we gather in this house, as I say. But you see, back in the day, in ancient Jerusalem, Jerusalem was the exclusive place to go and worship. 
Jerusalem is described in verse number three as a city that is compacted together. In Jerusalem, the 12 tribes of Israel came together in unity. But without worship, something is missing. We are incomplete. We are unfinished without worship. We find direction and, and purpose for our journey when we come into the house of the Lord. No matter what's going on in your personal lives, we can find some security by looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That's why we put smiles on our faces when we come to church. And we don't walk around looking like we're defeated, like nothing's ever going to work out in our life, like we done lost our best friend and like we've been sucking on lemons and persimmons all of our lives. We put smiles on our faces and we put clapping in our hair even when we got a bad report from the doctor, even when we get a pink slip on our desk, we give God the glory. Even if your car didn't start this morning, God still deserves the glory. No matter what's going on, we can still find reasons to rejoice because after the dust settles and the smoke clears, victory shall be mine. So I can thank God in advance. I know I ain't got it yet, but I can thank God in advance. I know it's not completed yet, but I can thank God in advance. The degree ain't in my hand yet, but I can thank God in advance. I can thank him because of what I know he got the power to do. God is good. Some of us, we ought to worship God in our homes, but that ain't enough. We must go into the house of the Lord. And here it is. Some of us who even attend church regularly don't have any enthusiasm when we come into the house of God. Some of us come in here like we have lost our best friend. Like ain't nothing going right in our lives. But let me tell you, my Bible said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If God done done something in your life, ain't nothing, ain't nothing wrong with letting God know you appreciate him. My mama told me a long time ago, if somebody do something for you, the least you can do is say thank you. Somebody give you a bone, you take the bone. Next time they'll give you a bone with some meat on it. If somebody do something for you, you show some appreciation. You show some gratitude for what they've done. God woke you up this morning, you ought to say thank you, sir. God put clothes on your back, you ought to say thank you, sir. God put food on your table, you ought to tell the Lord thank you. Food on your table, you got basic cable. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Some of us who attend church, like I said, we don't have any enthusiasm. And we find our desire to go to church dropping off a little bit. You ought not want to miss the service of God. Because let me tell you, if you miss one week, you're going to want to miss two. You miss two weeks, you're going to want to miss four. Then you miss so many that you're ashamed to come back. Well, they go, when I get in there, they're going to ask me where I've been and what I've been doing and, and this and that. You ought to be glad somebody cares something about your soul because evidently you don't care too much about it. If I'm in a place in my life where I'm not right with God and I'm walking outside of his will, I want somebody to come along and check me. I want somebody to come along and tell me, hey, you're doing wrong. You need to get right. Some of y'all know, you remember when you were younger and your mom and dad used to tell you stuff and you say to yourself, you wouldn't say it out loud because you wanted your teeth. But you said, you get to yourself, I can't stand my mom. She won't never let me have no fun. We always got to go to the church. Why I can't go do this and why I can't go do that? But now you're in a place in your life where you say, oh, I thank God for mama. I thank God for daddy. And you find yourself the same things they told you. You telling your kid. Our problem is pride. We don't want to be proved wrong. Even if you know you're wrong, you'll go about being wrong just as long as don't nobody come along and correct you. We got to humble ourselves. If you don't humble yourself, God will humble you. Oh, yes, he will. Oh, yes, he will. 
Let me tell you, you might have a million dollars in the bank account, and every time you talk to somebody, oh, you know, I got a million dollars in the bank account. Let me tell you, God will fix stuff in such a way that money just be leaving your hand just like that. And before you know it, you got a negative million in your account. Before you know it, God know how to humble you. And then we got many folk who look and find excuses for not attending service. Things that won't keep us from going to work. Keep us from attending church. Things that won't keep us from going to the movie or going to see the Jacksonville Jaguar. Keep us from coming to church. The truth of the matter is that if you are looking for a reason to stay at home, the devil going to make sure you find the reason that you need. Because he certainly don't want you to come into the house of God. Whatever excuse you have for not coming to God's house, whether you don't like what somebody said, uh, sister so-and-so get on my nerve, it doesn't excuse you in God's eyes. When you don't come to the house of God, here it is. That means you are disobeying God. What the Bible say, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some. I don't want to be like the psalm. Just because everybody else is jumping off a bridge don't mean I'm going to jump off a bridge behind them. I'm not going the way that everybody else is going, but I'm trying to work out my soul salvation with fear and with trembling. Then sometimes we do come to church. We got to change our attitudes. Sometimes we are just here in body and not here in spirit. Better right saying the song, my body's here with you, but my mind is out there. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But my mind is out there somewhere else. Your body, they act like they don't know. They was listening to it on the way to church this morning. I heard it. I heard it playing in the parking lot. Here it is. We come to the house of God and our body is here. But our mind is on something else. That's why John said in John chapter 4 and verse number 24, he said there's coming a time when those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Worshiping God in spirit means I got the right mindset. When I come into the house of God, I'm not looking at what she got on. I'm not worried about who he sent by. I'm not worried about he didn't shake my hand or she didn't shake my hand. But I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. And I got up this morning and I purpose in my heart that if don't nobody else want to praise him, I'll praise him all by myself. You ought to have a spirit of worship. A heart and a mind open to the spirit of God. A heart set on worshiping an awesome God. For he said, they that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. The church is the body of Christ. When you're in here, you on God's time. You're not on nobody else's time. Um, I, I taught my folk back home that a long time ago. Y'all might as well. I know y'all used to 15 and 20 minute sermons. But I'm going to be up here till I get done. <laughs> Sometimes we leave church. I didn't get in that night to service today. Did you bring anything to the service? I hate to tell you, but worship is not about you. But when we come to worship, we come to worship so that God might be glorified so that we can lift up the Savior, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and come into his court with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. The question ought to be, did God get anything out of that? You got to put something in in order to be able to get something out. You go stand in front of a candy machine or a soda machine. 
all day long just looking at that candy, just hoping that a lifesaver will drop out. But until you put something in the machine, you're not going to get nothing out of them. Sometimes we come to church and we leave with nothing because you ain't bring nothing in the first place. We're too mean to say amen, too ungrateful to clap our hands. We're too unthankful to pat our feet. But I dare you to come to church with a spirit and a mind made up to give God worship. I dare you to forget about yourself. Concentrate on him and worship God, our Father. You will leave rejoicing, saying that there is a reality in serving the true and the living God. We ought to be glad to come to church because this is a place of God's praises. The book of Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 10 says, The 20 and 4 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and forever. Here's a picture of the church in a great time of worship that's going to last forever. Can I tell you, if you don't want to give God glory down here, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have what they call gate trouble up there. Sometimes, here it is, church. The Bible says in Psalms 34 and 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Psalms 111 and 1 says, Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. Psalms 34 and 1 said, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. So often, we, we don't get much out of worship because we are far away from God in our spirit. If you know you ain't living according to God's will, don't expect to get nothing out. I learned something that God cannot fellowship sin. He can't fellowship sin. And I ask you a question. How many sins does it take to separate you from God? Somebody said about five or six. It don't take but one to separate you from God. So that's why, I don't know about y'all, but every day of my life, I find myself saying, Lord, forgive me. Even if I don't realize I done did something, I said, Lord, forgive me. Because I want my worship and I want my praise to be acceptable under God. I don't want my worship to be hindered because I don't like somebody. I don't want my worship to be hindered because I got a lying spirit. I don't want my worship to be here because I got a lustful spirit. I don't want my worship to be hindered because there's something going on in my life that God is not pleased with. I want to be able to worship him. And he receive my worship. So often we don't get much out of worship because we're just too far away from God. There was a husband and a wife. They had been married for they had been married for some years. And it said when they first got married with the old car they had, said they'd be riding down the road, said they were so close up on each other in the car that you couldn't tell if it was one or two people in the car. And said one day they was riding and said the wife looked over at the hub and she said, Baby, he said, What? Said. You know, it used to be a time we'd be riding together in the car and folk couldn't tell if it was one or two of us in the car. And now you're over there and I'm over here. Who moved? He said, well, the car is still made up the same. You're over there and I'm over here. Who moved? And if you find yourself at a place in your life where you're questioning whether or not God is as close to you as he used to be, and you feel like God's presence has drifted far away from you, I want to tell you something. God ain't moved. God is yet where he's always been. He's the same yesterday, today, and he'll be the same even forevermore. God don't change. My God ain't wishy-washy. He don't, he don't fold. He don't flip on you. God is always the same. You don't have to wake up in the morning and say, well, I wonder what side of the bed I woke up on this morning. If you're feeling like that, I want to let you know God ain't moved. You moved. And you need to move back to where you were 
so that you can enjoy the blessings of God. Sometimes we get just like the scribes and the Pharisees that Jesus rebuked in Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 8. These people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their heart <laughs> is far from me. And in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. I wonder, I wonder, are you worshiping and praising him today? Or are you just occupying space? It's time to give God all of your worship. We ought to be glad to come into the house of God because it's a place where God's presence is. Maybe you didn't realize it, but God is here right now. I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe you thought you were just coming together to see your friends and your family. But I want to let you know God is in this place here on this morning. Maybe you didn't realize he says in Matthew, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Isn't it great that God shows up in our worship? He's right here right now. He's watching us, and he knows that when praises go up, blessings will surely come down. God desires your worship, and he wants to be here to receive it. So many times, I can't stand churches that got a schedule. You sing your three verses and sit down. You sing your three, four standards, and you sit down. They get in there in their hand. They done did the whole service in 30, 45 minutes. They came and did what they did and went home, and God ain't never showed up. God, take time for you. Surely you can take some time for God. We sang a song back home many times each passing day. You can hear somebody say, just too busy to take time for the Lord. I would like to serve the king, but I can't do everything. Just too busy to take time for the Lord. Wonder if God had that same attitude about us and he was just, too busy to wake us up this morning and too busy to start us on our way and, and too busy to keep us in the way that he has kept us. The question is often asked, what if God treated us how we treated him? He is here, church, to encourage us. He is here to guide us. He is here to bless us. He is here to strengthen us. He is here to bestow his power upon us. Aren't you glad that you're here? Because God is here. We should be glad because the church is a place of God's people. This is where the family of God meets to fellowship and support one another. This is a place where the friends of Jesus come together to love on one another. The church will be a place where we encourage one another where we lift each other up in prayer. This is a place where brothers and sisters can come and love on one another. We are a family. We are family. I got all my sisters in me. We are family. We are a body with many members. And let me tell you something. You might as well get to loving your brothers and sisters. Because if you want to go to heaven, you're going to be seeing them every day. All the time. You ain't going to be able to get away from them. Every time you turn around, there they go. Every time you turn around, it's just like you, you ever been in the store and you, and you spotted somebody you didn't want to see. Because you know they going to be talking a whole hour and you got a schedule and you're trying to go. So in order to avoid that conversation, you will get your buggy and you will speedily go down to another aisle. And sometimes by the time you get down there, hey, Brother Reed, how you doing? You ought to learn to love one another. We ought to learn to care for one another because we're going to be together for an eternity. That's if you want to go to heaven. We're going to be together for an eternity. So we ought to start right now. The closest relationship that we should have should be with God's people. Friends don't treat you like they used to 
when you became a part of the family of God. We should be glad because the church is a place of the peace of God. Jesus is the prince of peace. If you can't find peace in God's house, where can you find peace? It is each of our responsibility to make sure that peace is maintained in the house of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, he says, Let all bitterness and wrath, anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be what? Kind to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. I put a post up the other day and I said, um, you ought to forgive other people even if they aren't sorry. Then I had a lady to come in and say, well, well I'm going to forgive them for it. They ain't sorry. You've missed what forgiveness is all about. Forgiveness is not for the benefit of the other person. Forgiveness is for you. And let me tell you something. There ain't nothing that nobody can say or do to me that's worth me walking around here holding anger and animosity in my heart towards that person. Because here it is, while I'm walking around mad and upset with you, I'm blocking my blessings. I, I'm blocking what God can do in my life. And I don't know about you, but I don't just want some of what God got for me. I want everything. And, and if me being angry and upset with you is going to hinder that, I can get over that. Because let me tell you, it ain't nobody that's going to call me to miss help me go to hell. Not nobody. They, they say, they say, oh, bad. I don't believe in bad luck. It ain't but one bad luck you can have. That's to miss heaven and end up in hell. And that ain't even luck. That's a choice that you make by the life that you live. So he said, be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven you. Y'all remember? At a place in your life, you was on your way to a devil's hell. One fit to live, too scared to die. But you found Jesus on that road, and God changed your life. Now people are looking at you, used to be gangbanger, used to be dope slanger, used to be club hopper, used to be, you know, you, boy, used to be the life of the party. But now God has calmed you down. God has brought you to a different place in your life. And things that used to entertain you, they don't entertain you anymore. Things that used to keep your attention, they don't keep your attention anymore. Because you realize there's nothing out there that this world has to offer you that is better than what God has to offer you. But you realize that all, not some, but all spiritual blessings are found in Jesus Christ. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You ought to be glad to come to church, lastly, because there's power in the word. Singing is all right. You about had me about to do a lap around the building this morning. If I wasn't scared they was going to put me out, I'd have did that lap. But singing is all right. But there's power in the word. Praying is good, but there's power in the word. I want you to know this morning that when you come to church, there ought to be a word from the Lord. I'm glad that it's a powerful word. I'm glad that it's a soul-saving word. I'm glad that it's a delivering word. I'm glad that it's a eternal word. I'm glad that it's an everlasting word. I'm glad that it's an unchanging word. Somebody here this morning need to understand that God deserves your best. You ought not give God no half-hearted praise. You ought not give God no sorry praise. God deserves your best. Your praise must be your best. Every time we enter into the house of God, we ought to give him our best. Every time we read a scripture, we should give him our best. Every time we pray a prayer, we should give God our best. Every time we sing a song, we ought to give God our best. And every time we give an offering,
man carpet. We ought to give God our best. We give our best. Brother Crosby, for no other reason, he gave us his best. The Bible says that he gave his only begotten son. Way out down the hill called Calvary. The Bible says that he hung down from the sixth to the ninth hour. And he cried that it is finished. It is finished. I've given my life. It is finished. I've given my blood. It is finished. I have paid the price. It is finished. Whosoever believes in me shall not perish but have ever, everlasting life. I don't know about you, but I'm going to give God my best. I'm going to give God the best of my time. I'm going to give God the best of my talents. I'm going to give God the best of my praise because he's worthy of it. And let me tell you, church, no matter what you got going on in your life, you still got a reason to praise God. You still got a reason to give God glory. Because let me tell you, there are some people in this world that wish they could freely praise God. But they have restrictions. They're not able to come. But here it is. Some of us will let any and everything stop us from giving God some glory. I got to tell y'all about my best friend. His name is Chance. Chance here, a few months ago, Chance, he started to complain about his stomach was hurting. And he was having problems with not being able to eat. And he said, well, it's probably because of the weather change and stuff. He said, I get over it. And it never got any better. And so here a couple weeks ago, I took Chance to the hospital. I said, we need to go find out what's going on. So I took him to the hospital. Mind you, he's 26 years old. And I took him to the hospital, and he stayed in the hospital a whole week long. And they finally said, they came to him, and they said, you got stage 3 cancer. Started in your throat, and it spread it to your lungs. He already had a bad heart. He's been on a pacemaker all of his life. The chemo has now weakened his heart. He has pneumonia right now. But yet he texted me this morning and said, I'm on my way to church. You think you got it bad. If you just take time to look at the situation that somebody else got going on in their life, you wouldn't dare fix your mouth to complain about nothing. But you say, hey, no matter what position I am in my life, I'm going to give God praise. I'm going to give God glory while I got a chance right now because I don't know what tomorrow we're going to bring. Just graduated from Alabama State University, criminal justice degree, got a job as a, a private detective with the state of Alabama, and not all of that has gone down the drain because now you got to get your health together. Your mama died a year ago with cancer. Four months after your mama died, your grandmama died with cancer. And now you're having to suffer with that. But you're not letting that keep you at home. We still by our toe. Well, I guess I ain't going to church today. It's raining, and, you know, I just did my hair. I don't want it to frizz up. Go in the closet and get one of them wigs and slap it on. I mean... That is a solution for every problem. Slap that, get in the mirror, slap that joker on it, comb it. Well, I ain't got nothing to wear. It's dressed down Sunday. Come as y'all. We find any and every reason not to give God praise. I was talking to him last week. He said, he said, T, I just don't know. He said, man, I don't understand why I'm having to go through this. He said, but I know God understands. He said, I got plans for my life. He said, I don't want to go out like this. He said, I got plans for my life, things that I want to do. And he said, I just don't see myself going out like this. He said, but even if this is God's plan, I'm all right. He said, I'm all right. I'm all right. Even though every day of my life I got all, I got all these needles and stuff hooked up to me, having to go through all this, I, I'm all right. Because God understands. And because of what Jesus did for me on Calvary, 
I know I got something to look forward to in the after while. And I was shamed for a minute because I said, man, I ain't got that kind of faith, y'all. Cause let me tell you, life will take you through some stuff. If you ain't never been on your knees, life will bring you down to your knees. If you ain't never cried before, life will make you shed a cup of tears every now and then. If you ain't never stood at the front of a church and looked down in the face of your loved one after they breathed their last breath and after they have said their last word and said, Lord, I don't understand why you had to take my mom and why you had to take my daddy, but I know you're too just to do it wrong, too wise to make any kind of mistake. So I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. And in spite of that, he deserves my praise. He deserves my glory. So I want you to take that basket of excuses that you got here, and I want you to throw it away. Take, get, get, get rid of that mindset that I don't have to be present in God's house, that I'm all right. Get rid of that mindset that I can just do whatever I want to do, and because I'm on Sweetwater Church of Christ Road, I'm going to heaven. You got it messed up. Anybody that told you that you was on your way to heaven after you went in that water, let me tell you, you might have just went down a, wet, a dry devil and came up a wet devil. Well, I've been baptized. My name is on the roll, and I'm going to heaven. You got any uh, one-way tickets to heaven? You got any? You, you gave them all out. Dang, I wanted one. Any, any, anybody? You, bro, you? Ain't nobody here that can give you the security of after you've been baptized, here you go, this is a one-way ticket. It's punched. You ain't got to do nothing else. You're on your way to heaven. That's the, that's the mindset of some people. Get in the church, act a plum fool. Still lying. Still hateful. Still mean. Got a nasty attitude. Can't nobody hold a two-minute conversation with you without you talking about somebody, without you in somebody else's bin. But, oh, you get mad when ready to scrap with somebody talking about you. You done forgot what flavor your Kool-Aid is. All up in my refrigerator trying to see what I got up in it. We got to get it in our church. You know why there's such a, a mass number of young and old people that are leaving the faith? What are the examples? Where are the examples? Where are those that are going to stand up for what is right? Where are those? I don't care about how you feel. I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to hear. I like what Paul said. Paul said, have I become your enemy? Because I tell you, a real friend is going to tell you exactly what you might not speak to me no more. You might not invite me out to eat no more. I can buy my own food. You might, you might not, you might not have, hold a conversation. You might not want to hang out with me no more, but guess what? I can be satisfied in knowing that I told you exactly what it is that you need. And whether you heed my attempt, my warning or not, I done told you. We got too many yes men. Too many do boys. And not enough people that's just going to be straight up and real with you. That's the only way I know how to be with people is straight up. Because I want you to be straight up with me. I don't want you to lie to me. Tell me what I need to hear. If I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. And if I get mad or if I get glad, I'll be all right. Be all right. After a while, and somewhere down the road, I'm going to realize, hey, Brother Cosby cares something about me to even come out of his way to tell me what I needed to hear. But we get defensive. Oh, they picking at me. You ain't saying nothing to her. She ain't been to church in three Sundays, but you want to say something to me. Be glad somebody's watching after you. You ought to be glad that when you ain't here, somebody calling you. 
somebody texting you, Instagramming you, Snapchatting you, tweeting you, somebody getting in contact with you. Hey, man, where you was today? I don't even really care where you was. I ain't trying to get in your business, but we missed you. And we love you. Anything I can do for you, let me know. That's our job. What did it say? The shepherd, if he have a hundred sheep and one go astray, he'll leave the ninety-nine for that one. Every single individual in here, I want you to know, you are important. You are important to the body of Christ. Just because you may operate as a toe does not mean that you are less important than the ear. Just because you may operate as a finger does not mean that you are any less important than the eye. Everybody can't do the same thing. Everybody can't preach. Everybody can't be an elder. Everybody can't be a deacon. Everybody can't serve in different capacities, but everybody can do something. And when you do the something that you can do, the work of the Lord will go forward. Don't get mad because they didn't call your name because you weren't doing it to get a certificate. Oh, she picked up a piece of paper off the floor, and we just want to congratulate her for all of her hard work, for all those pieces of paper that she's picked. And we get our pitch, you know, our Kodak moment because she picked up a piece of paper off the floor. No. You do what you do for God. God gave me strength to be able to reach down and pick up a piece of paper. I'm glad that God gave me the ability to do that. Everything you do for Jesus, let it be real. Let's be real in our worship. Let's be real in our praise to God. Don't just be shouting.